Hi guys, happy Tuesday. I hope you guys had a great day today because today was a very beautiful day. I hope that you were able to spend some time outside, see the sunlight, go outside, and enjoy your day. But, but above all, you should give thanks to God for today. So let's stop for a second and let's thank God. Thank you, God, for blessing us with such a beautiful day. Amen. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So today's online lesson is going to be a little bit different, okay? So for today's lesson, I hope that you guys still have your blessed first reconciliation book, okay? Uh, if you guys left it at the church, shame on you. You guys should not leave your stuff behind. If you lost it, shame on you. You guys shouldn't lose your books behind. Uh, if you don't have it, well, we're going to use this book. I hope you do have it. I hope you didn't lose it, and uh, that's okay. Also, what we're going to use is we're going to read a little bit from our Bible today. And from our Bible, we're just going to read uh, for our, an opening prayer. And we're going to read from the Psalms. If you remember the Psalms, I told you about them a couple weeks ago in a couple other videos, that the Psalms were what King David prayed. And uh, they're not just what he prayed, he wrote most of them. And so with King David, uh, we are able to pray with the words that he wrote. And we're able to give thanks and blessings to God, and we're able to uh, learn about God even as he wrote about him. So we're going to pray Psalm 15, okay? Psalm 15 is on page 844 of your Catholic Children's Bible. And we're going to start. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, who may enter your temple, who may worship on Zion, your sacred hill? Those who obey God in everything, and always do what is right, whose words are true and sincere, and who do not slander others. They do no wrong to their friends, nor spread rumors about their neighbors. They despise those whom God rejects, but honor those who obey the Lord. They always do what they promise, no matter how much it may cost. They make loans without charging interest, and cannot be bribed to testify against the innocent. Whoever does these things will always be secure. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. So t we just read Psalm 15. Uh, I always, t I think I tell you guys this every week, but I don't like how, uh, because this is a children's Bible, they make the English, they make everything very easy for you guys to understand, and in vocabulary, hopefully you guys would know. But even then, I don't like how they phrase this. Now, Psalm 15, very cool fact, you guys. Uh, we don't hear it. It's in our Mass. We don't hear it on Sunday Mass, but it's in our Mass books. Um, not our Communion Mass books, but in the normal Mass books. It's in our Mass for daily Mass. So what that is, is we pray Psalm 15 instead of a couple other prayers during daily Mass that happens Monday through Friday, but we don't pray it for Sunday Mass. So Psalm 15 is actually dedicated in our Mass book for our daily Masses and for just normal days that aren't Sundays. But on Sundays, we pray a prayer instead of Psalm 15. So I hope you guys can kind of get that. There's prayers that are always prayed every Sunday Mass, but for Masses that aren't on Sunday, we pray Psalm 15 a lot. And so and it's in the beginning of our Mass books, not our First Communion Mass books, because our First Communion won't be on a weekday, but... Uh, we pray this psalm. So let's let's look at the psalm, right? Um, Lord, who may enter your your temple? Who may worship on Zion, your sacred hill? So in, uh, the, in another way to say it, and what it would originally be, is Lord, who may enter your temple? Who may worship on your holy mountain? Who can abide? Who can worship and who can live on your holy mountain? So in the, the first thing is that David is asking God, who can, who can be with you on your holy mountain? Who can be there to just live with you and uh, pray with you and stay with you the whole time? And we look at it, and it's such a good, it's such a like, great question to ask. Like, what kind of, what kind of person should we be? All right. So then David explains it, and he prays with it. He's like, those who obey God in everything and always do what is right, whose words are true and sincere, and who do not slander others. So when you slander somebody, it means you're gossiping about them, you're saying something bad about them, uh, or you're just being mean to them in person, you're saying rude things. So that's somebody who slanders. 
when you slander someone, you're not doing something good. You're doing something bad. Okay. So if you, so we got this right. We obey God in everything. We always do what is right, and uh, we got to make sure our words are true and sincere. Right. It's not good for me to just uh, look at somebody and say, uh, "Hey, you're pretty cool," but like I don't really mean it. <laughs> Uh, what if I said it sarcastically? No, no, I have to say it truly. I have to actually mean like this person is really cool. Like I think you're an awesome person. I think you're amazing, or you are you are very kind. And I truly, I truly like say that from the bottom of my heart. Like I actually mean it. Like you have to be sincere in what you say. The same thing when you're sorry. Uh, you know, like I'm sorry I did this. Not I'm sorry. Not that. You don't just say, like, I'm sorry because somebody, your parents said, say sorry. And then you say, I'm sorry. And, like, you say it, like, in such a mean way and in such a rude way that you didn't actually mean it. You have to actually mean it. Right? So, whoever, uh, whose words are true and sincere. You want your words to be true and sincere. It's very important. All right, let's, let's keep going. So, those who don't send to others, they do no wrong to their friends, right? You don't want to do anything wrong to your friends, right? You don't want to sin against them. You don't want to say bad things about them. You want to be fair with them, uh, nor spread rumors about their neighbors. So, again, you're not spreading rumors. To spread When you spread a rumor about somebody else, you're gossiping, and you're saying something completely wrong, and you're lying about them. You're bearing false witness against your neighbor. Okay? And then... Who else? So they despise those whom God would... Let's see. The person who can live on God's holy mountain. He's still talking about this person. That person who despises those whom God rejects. So God doesn't reject... He, in the way that this is phrased, it's not that God rejects people and like says only we can have God's love or only he loves only us. But uh, for those people that completely go against God, if we were to say... Uh, if we were to make fun of those people, like we'd be in the wrong still, right? But uh, other than that, we want to honor those who obey the Lord, right? What does that mean? So he says it here. He's like, they despise those whom God rejects, but honor those who obey the Lord. So a good man honors those who obey the Lord. And someone who honors and obeys the Lord, uh, we can think of a few people. We can think of saints, right? We can think of the saints first and foremost, because they're people who honored and obeyed the Lord, but... They're not here on this earth. So who else can we honor? We can honor a religious brother, a religious sister, a nun, a priest, because hopefully they're honoring and obeying the Lord. But the way they're living their lives, already they're at a point where they should be honoring and obeying the Lord because they dedicated and gave up their lives to do God's will. Um, but then it, does, it's, it goes further than that. It's, there's other people in this world that honor and obey the Lord. It could be your parents. It could be your neighbors. So you want to honor those who are really good people. So if you see somebody that's really, like, they they look very holy, they look very, like, put together, they're going to church all the time, they're praying, and they do a lot of great things, like, it'd be nice to say something kind about them. It'd be nice to say, like, you know what? I see that this person does a lot for God, and I want to pray for them. By praying for them, you're honoring them, which is a really great thing. Okay, so let's see. Uh, good. So then David continues in his prayer. King David continues on verse 4. You know, we went over, they despise those whom God rejects, and, but they honor those who obey the Lord. So this is still, we're still thinking about somebody that uh, lives on God's holy mountain, right? And who, someone who can live on God's holy mountain and praise him. They always do what they promise, no matter how much it may cost. They make loans without charging interest and cannot be bribed to testify against the innocent. Whoever does these things will always be secure. Uh, another way to say that last line is whoever does these things will always be just. And that's the person that can live in God's holy mountain. Right? You do what you promise to do. And you do it. Uh, you don't care about how much it's going to cost. Right? Uh, not just about money. It's not just about money. When something costs something, it's not just about money. It costs time. It costs effort. It costs, uh, it costs other things. Right, and um, then there's the last line. They make loans. You know, you you don't want to make loans and then charge interest. Meaning, you don't want to take advantage of somebody, especially with money. You might think it's like, oh, this is a wise business decision. I could buy this toilet paper roll because that's what everyone's buying these days, and I could sell it for instead of five, the two dollars that it cost me, I could sell it for twenty dollars. 
that's very wrong okay that's taking advantage of somebody who's not in a position to buy toilet paper at that price so you don't want to think about uh, selling something or to take advantage of people's money especially when uh, uh, they're asking for your help so you don't want to do that okay let's see and I think that about covers the psalm. So whoever does these things will always be secure, will be just. Uh, those people who does these things, who does what's right, right? What David was saying, they can live on God's holy mountain and praise and worship him. And the holy mountain is not like, a, we're not thinking of like a real mountain. We're not thinking of like a physical mountain. We're thinking of heaven, right? Those people are going to be with God in heaven. And the people who obey God in everything, do what is right, whose words are true and sincere and do not slander with the tongue, they don't do anything wrong to their friends. They don't spread rumors about their neighbors. They despise those whom God rejects and honors those who fear the Lord. They always do what they promise, no matter how much the cost, and they don't make loans and ha and charge people extra money. Okay? Those people are good people. Uh, and that's not the only thing that makes a person a good person, but King David wrote this as a prayer, and he was thinking about like who's going to be with God to praise and live with them where he is. And so I think that's a very beautiful thing. Now, you can put your Bibles away. Okay. Today's lesson is going to come from the Blessed Book. We're going to start on page 211. All right, I'll say it again. 211. Okay, so we have, uh, if you guys remember, we did this once so far. In the back of your Blessed Book, there's a bunch of questions and answers. And it uh, tells you where you can find the answers to these questions, where you can find the answers to the answers anyway. But there's a bunch of questions and answers for us, for you guys, not for me. I don't really need it. I already, I know all of this. <laughs> but for you guys, if you ever forget a lot of our lessons and a lot of the lessons that we could know, we should know, uh, this book covers a lot of lessons. And we went over this way back in uh, the fall, back in the like, like November, October-ish. We went into this book and we saw that there is all these questions like, you know, at the top of the page, if we look at question number 36, it says, why did Jesus suffer and die? And the answer is, so that we could be forgiven our sins and live with him in heaven forever after this life. Okay, so let's continue on question 37. What do we call the mystery of God becoming man? The mystery of the incarnation. On what day did Jesus die on the cross? Good Friday, the day after the Last Supper. Okay, so this is review. We learned this in a past video that I went over. But it's really good that we have this, that it's here, it's in the back of the book. I'm hoping that like you guys were able to remember that I just pointed this out for you guys. Um, so let's, let's keep going. So let's go to question 40. We'll go to question 40. What gifts do we receive as a result of being saved by Jesus? By dying on the cross, Jesus restored our relationship with God and opened a floodgate of grace. Now, if we look at the next question, it's because we don't know what grace is. What is grace? Grace is the help God gives us to respond generously to his call to do what is good and right, grow in virtue, and live holy lives. Now, I wish this book had the follow-up question, what's virtue? <laughs> well, let's look, let's think about it. I'll, talk, I'll tell you guys what virtue is. So... Let's, let's read this answer from 41. Grace is the help God gives us to respond generously to his call to do what is good and right, grow in virtue, and live holy lives. Virtue is a habit. So you guys know you, how you have bad habits and you have good habits. You, you might have the habit of uh, biting your fingernails, or you might have a habit of uh, you keep saying the same word over and over again in a sentence and everybody knows that you say it. It's like when you can't say a sentence properly and you say it um, uh, uh, um, uh, before, between every other word. Those are bad habits. Then there's good habits. Good habits are virtues and good habits are also, uh, there's also other good habits, but virtues are still kind of different than like those other habits that we just talked about. Virtues are things that we don't really think about as virtues because we don't know that they're virtues, but they're things like patience and uh, prudence which means like I can think, uh, I think before I do anything stupid. Um, there's uh, what else is there? There's other virtues. There's virtues of uh, fortitude. They call it fortitude is a virtue of being uh, strong, but not just like not physically strong, right? Fortitude is like how how much can you handle like uh, mentally, uh, physically, but also 
Uh, are you strong in your faith? Is also another thing. Are you strong in how much you put your hope into God? Is your faith strong? Right? That's fortitude. It's like a, when you think of fortitude, I like to think of the word fortress. There's the first, you take the first half of the word fort, and then the other half of the word tattooed. <laughs> it's your fort. A fort, if you think of a fort, right, you think of a, like a castle, you think of a place, a defense base. It's strong, it's there, it's sturdy. When you think of tattooed, <laughs> you think of attitude, right? So you need to have the attitude of being strong and sturdy and like you're going to protect. You, get, you need to have that, so, that strong sense that you need to protect. So I like, the, I like the virtue of fortitude because I like to split its word, its, uh, the word apart and think about it like that. Um, then, then there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other virtues. There's about 70, around 70 virtues last I remember I read about. But uh, there's a very important ones that we like to talk about. And this is going to talk to, this book is going to tell us about the next virtues we're going to read about. And I'm not going to go over every single virtue, but the virtues are things that we do every single day of our life. So we have patience, we have prudence, we have temperance, uh, you know, virtue of courage, a virtue of, um, uh, I can't think of any. It's harder to think of when I'm on the spot, but uh, if you look up virtues, if you look up a list of virtues on Google, you can easily find what virtues are virtues. So but let's, let's talk about some virtues that you won't normally see in everyday lives, right? What is faith? Faith is a virtue. So faith, we've talked about it. Faith is a gift from God. It's a supernatural virtue that allows us to firmly believe all the truth that God has revealed to us. So faith is a supernatural virtue, right? Uh, it's something that you have to practice, not physically. Uh, with things like patience, you physically have to be patient to practice patience. With things like fortitude, you physically have to be have that fortitude attitude. You definitely just have to sit there and be and like be strong and be like enduring, be courageous, right? Those are physical. Faith, it says, is a supernatural virtue. You have to actually believe, but your physical actions don't deal with that. It's supernatural. Because it's supernatural, uh, it's not normally natural, right? Natural is things that we could like touch and hold and like practice and like I could practice playing piano. That's a good. That's a good habit, right? It'd be a virtue to be good to, at practicing something. I could practice patience in other ways. Faith is something that is harder to practice because it deals with something that you don't physically do. You actually have to believe in God. You guys believe in God, right? Then you have faith. You're believing by not seeing. You're not seeing God, but just because you're not seeing Him. Uh, every single day of your life doesn't mean that he's not there. But you're practicing this faith of virtue that every day you believe that he's there and that he's strong and that you'll know him and that the God is the truth, that God is real, that God is there and that he really is there. And we believe this, all of us. It's not just that we don't see him, but we do see him in the Eucharist. But uh, when we're in heaven, we're going to see him differently. And uh, we'll see him as who he is, as God. But for now, faith is like seeing without believing, right? Thomas, remember Thomas the Apostle? We talked about him a couple of videos ago, and I talked about him last video too. He needed to see to believe that Jesus Christ rose. He wanted to touch. And while that's not a bad thing, right? Uh, Jesus said to him, Oh, you have little faith. He said, You have a little, you have barely any faith, Thomas. But here, I want I'll, you. You can touch me anyway, because I love you, and I want you to know that I actually rose from the dead. Go ahead and touch my wounds. So, what a beautiful thing that we have this virtue of uh, faith. It's a supernatural virtue that allows us to firmly believe all the truth that God has revealed to us. So, let's look at question forty-three on the next page. What is hope? Hope is a gift from God. It is a supernatural virtue that allows us to firmly trust that God will keep all his promises and lead us to heaven. So hope, right? We have hope that we're all going to go to heaven. That's our hope that we're, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to be with God. We're going to be with our loved ones who might be in heaven. Uh, and then at the end of our lives, when we pass away, uh, we have hope that God keeps his promises to us, that we obeyed God's commandments and we live good, holy lives. 
we can have that hope that we'll go to heaven, right? The hope is that God will have mercy and forgiveness on us, even though we may have committed so many more sins in our future, we, might be, we may have committed so many sins in our lives, we have hope in God's forgiveness, we have hope in his mercy, and we have hope that we'll be in heaven and rejoice with God and give him praise and rejoice with all of our loved ones. When people lack hope, when people don't have hope, it's very sad because uh, sometimes we lose people that we love here on earth, but we don't think about having hope. We think, oh, we lost them, my life is miserable, my life is awful. But with hope, because we have hope of heaven, it's great news. We have hope that we're going to see our loved ones once again, but we have to have the hope that they're in heaven too. We have to have hope that our loved ones, our uncles, our cousins, that they're living good and holy lives and obeying God's commands. Even your parents, even your brothers and sisters, and yourself. We need to obey God's commands so that we can have this hope, right? Uh, I have great hope for my family members. I have great hope for my cousins. Even if my cousins, I have some cousins, they don't, none of them go to, some of them don't go to church. They don't go to church at all. They don't care about God. They don't really do much. And uh, I'm very sad for them for that. And it makes me so sad because I'm worried about them going to heaven. I, I want to have a hope that they're going to go to heaven, right? Is it unfair for me to expect them to go to heaven? even though they're not obeying God's commands? Uh, it, it might be unfair because maybe what if God has mercy on them, but I'd be happy if God had mercy on them. I'd be happy if God forgave them, even if they lived terrible lives on this earth. But if they don't want to go to heaven, and if they're not choosing God every single day, and if we're not choosing God every single day, then uh, why are we hoping for heaven if we're not expecting to try to even get to heaven? God gave us instructions, he gave us commands, he gave us everything we need to be with him, to choose him, and to love him. And when you're in heaven, remember we talked about this again, back in so many months ago. We talked about this. When you're in heaven, you're going to be with God every single day. Heaven is being with God and is being in his presence. Hell is the opposite. Hell is where God has taken his presence out of. He, God made hell, he took his presence out of it, and it's, and it's our choice if we want to go to hell. If we don't know, if we don't choose God, if we don't love God, if we don't know who God is, and He says, uh, and one day we show up to heaven, we show up to the gates of heaven, and God says, "Why should I forgive you?" Uh, you know, we have hope in His forgiveness, we have hope in His mercy, but it wouldn't. God could still say to us, like, "You didn't choose me. You don't love me." You're not going to be happy if I bring you with me to heaven. And so because we need to live our lives hoping for God and hoping for heaven, we need to choose him every single day. Because it's only fair if we choose God and if we choose to live our lives dedicated to him so that we can have hope that we'll go to heaven. And even if we mess up and we stumble along the way, as long as we're attempting every single day to live our best lives, to live our lives dedicated to God, then we can go to heaven. Uh, then we hope in God's mercy and forgiveness. And if we don't, then it, it makes it hard for us to hope to go to heaven. But we want to make sure we want to go. And so even with our loved ones, even with our cousins, our family members that don't go to church, we need to pray for them. We need to tell them like, hey, like God exists and we're going to go to, we want to go to heaven one day and rejoice all together. You should choose God. And you just try to live your life dedicated to him. Because if you don't love him here on earth, then like, what's the point? You're going to go to heaven. You're not going to even like heaven at that, at that point. And so we need to tell others, like, listen, uh, hopefully at the end of our lives, we can all be together. Uh, we can be with our family members. We can be together in heaven. And I really want that. So if you love the people around you, have hope for them. Hope that if they're, not, if they're living bad lives, you have hope that they're going to change. Uh, have hope that God will uh, help them with that in their life. And pray for them. All of these things, all of these virtues, they deal with prayer. They deal with praying for one another, right? And so we want to pray for uh, our family members. We want to pray for those that don't know God, that don't love God, or they don't obey God, uh, or they don't go to the church, and they don't go to church at all. They haven't gone since First Communion or they haven't gone to confession since First Communion, 
or their wedding day. <laughs> so make sure you guys have hope for that. And just hope and place your hope into God in all things. When you ask for something you pla- into God, when you ask God for something, you place faith into them, and then you place hope into them. So you have faith and you believe that he'll do it, and then you hope that he'll, you, that he'll do it. Okay? But, uh, again, you want to be able to pray and pray for good things and pray for the ones that you love and the people around you. Okay, so let's go to question 44. What is charity? Charity is a gift from God. Okay, so it's another gift from God. God gives us so many gifts. Uh, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like it's my birthday. It's how, of how many gifts he keeps giving us. So charity is a gift from God. All grace is a gift from God. It is a supernatural virtue that allows us to love God above everything else and our neighbor as ourselves. So charity, right? We're not talking about like, well, we kind of are talking about, we're not just talking about like charity, like, oh, I do charity work or I do this kind of charity and I run this charity or that charity. Charity, the word itself. So we talk about, we always think about the word love, (laughs) the word love. Uh, it's charity. Uh, when we think about it, the word charity is actually the word for love. Mind blowing. So, charity is a gift from God, and charity uh, is another word way to say love, right? So, these three virtues we just talked about. We talked about faith. We talked about hope. Now we're talking about charity. A lot of times, in a lot of prayers, you hear about charity, but you hear it as love. We talk about the virtues of faith, hope, and love. You'll hear it all the time in a lot of different prayers when people start saying, we pray for an increase of faith and we pray for an increase of hope and love. But sometimes people will say charity. And charity is the proper term for that virtue of love. Right? Charity is the act. Right? So we talk, we talk about how we can do things, right? Um, charity is, an, is a supernatural virtue, but this one uh, is actually physical. This one you could still have. So, uh, charity, being a gift from God, being what it is, it's love, is us obeying God's commands. It's uh, putting God before all things, right? I am the Lord your God. Uh, you shall ha- have any other gods before me. Or even if you want, we want to look at the two greatest commandments, my favorite, right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your spirit, all your strength, all your soul. And you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. You should love everybody and then again, God said later on, love others as I have loved you. Jesus Christ said that. Love others as I have loved you. So because God loves you so much, you need to love other people so much. And you need to put action into it. You have to actually do something for them. Now, when we talk about this, when we talk about loving somebody, we talk about charity. This is, one, this is the big one. This is the biggest one. Okay? Uh, this goes back to something I was talking about back in the psalm. Uh, Psalm 15, you have to be sincere. You have to actually want to do it, and you actually have to do it with love and with charity. Uh, When I say that, um, I can give you an example, right? Uh, This is an easy example for me to say, but uh, let's say I'm passing by a homeless man on the street, okay? And I see this happen all the time in Detroit when I'm, I'm in there. I can say I've done this for myself, which is wrong. If I pass by a homeless person and uh, all I do is I struggle to look around my car and I find like a full water bottle I can give them and maybe a granola bar. And let's say I just toss those at the person. Let's say I just toss the granola bar and the water bottle at that person. I don't even like take a minute to just talk to them, ask for their name, tell them God bless you. I just toss it at them like they're some wild animal. In that moment, God, God did tell us, feed the sick. Uh, feed the homeless, feed the poor. But in that moment, I didn't have charity. I didn't actually, like, just do anything. In fact, I might have even made his life worse to make him feel like an animal, almost. Uh, And that wouldn't be charity. And a lot of people, they do this all the time, thinking, oh, I did something good. I gave a homeless man stuff. Well, really, you hurt him. Uh, You might have hurt his feelings. You might have made him feel like less of a human. Another way we could talk about charity is when... um, when we act to do something, right? We know we should be doing something, but we don't. But we and we do it, but we do it with complaining. So when you complain about doing something, you're not doing it with charity. Uh, even if it's even if you're doing a good thing, even if you're doing something to help the church, but you're still complaining or you don't put any love into it, 
uh, for me, one of the things I used to do, and I still do to this day, is sometimes I'll go around the different churches. Maybe I'll go to the sisters' convents where the Maser all live, all the sisters, all the nuns. I'll go to their convents and I'll do a lot of gardening for them. I'll pull out weeds. And why would I do that for someone else, right? Sure, they could ask me to do it and I could complain about doing it, but I do it out of love. I do it out of charity. I do it because I want to do it and I love to do it for them and I'm happy to do it for them. And that's what that's a good example of charity, that I'm doing it from the sincerity of my heart because I want to do it and I love to do it. All right? So enough about that. Let's look at the last question that we're going to go over for today. Question 45. Will God give you the gifts of faith, hope, and charity? Yes, God gives the gifts of faith, hope, and charity freely to all those who ask for them sincerely and consistently. And now he gives you these gifts. When you have a gift, you have to open it. You have to take it, right? When you, when you get a gift for your birthday, you don't just stare at the bag. You have to put it into use. So what did you get? All right, let's say you got jeans for Christmas. Let's say you got jeans for your birthday from your aunt or your grandma. You're going to wear those jeans. <laughs> or you're going to take them back, but you're still going to get the money for them, so you can still use that money. But you're going to use whatever your gift was. You get a video game, you're going to use it. You get an iPad, you're going to use it. You get faith, hope, and charity. You're going to use these gifts, uh, just like all the other gifts God gives you. So you're going to use them by placing your faith into God, placing your hope into God, and placing your love into everything you do, loving God, praying, and blessing others. So we have these gifts, we have these things, and they're very nice, they're very good to use, and to use these gifts and to take advantage of them because they're gifts that God gives us. Now, a cool thing, I really want to tell you guys a cool thing, a really, really cool thing. Um, it, when we're in heaven, when you're in heaven, uh, you won't have the gift of faith anymore because you won't need it. Because when you're in heaven, you'll know that God exists. <laughs> when you're in hell, you'll still know that God exists. But after you, after your life ends, you won't have faith anymore. But for now, we got to take advantage of faith. We'll still have hope and charity. We have hope that God, that something amazing will happen for the people we pray for on earth. Uh, so we'll still have that. And we have charity because we pray. And out of the sincerity of our heart, we pray for the people on earth. And uh, whoever is asking for our prayers also. Know that the people in heaven, we talk about them. We talk about the saints a lot. And I told you, it's not just the saints that we know uh, in heaven. There could be so many other people whose names we don't know that are in heaven. Uh, it could be our, it could even be loved ones. It could be your parents' grandparents. And if they're in heaven, you better believe it, they're praying for us. Okay? Uh, in turn, uh, remember there's that place called purgatory. It's where people go before they enter heaven. Uh, if they had some sins, but they still needed to have a, a pure, clean soul, but their soul wasn't totally pure and clean, but God had mercy on them and didn't send them to hell. So after purgatory, they go straight to heaven. We need to pray for them too. And I could probably give you a deeper lesson on that, but I won't because this video is getting long. Now, last thing, I said question 45 was the last one, but I looked at question 46, and I want to just say it as the last, last uh, beautiful thing. Question 46. How long will God love me for? God will love you forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great rest of the day.